Ok. Bom, bom dia a todos. Eu sou o Pedro Benedetti, eu sou aluno de doutorado na USP, e eu fui convidado pelos organizadores do evento, né, e aceitei com muita honra fazer parte desse, desse evento, é, para mediar essa comunicação de, de quinta-feira de manhã. É um prazer enorme. Eu vou apresentar o professor Roland Steinecker. Ele é autor do livro Die Vandalen, Aufsieg und Fall eines Barbaren Reichs. I hope my German was not that terrible. <risos> e foi publicado em 2016 pela editora Klet Cotta e ele teve seu mestrado orientado por Walter Pohl na Universidade de Viena. Né? Então ele está por dentro de todos esses é, debates envolvendo etnogênese né, que se iniciam aí com uh, o Reinhard Wenskus. Né? Ele foi orientado do doutorado na mesma universidade, na Universidade de Viena, uh, pelo professor Henrik Wolfram, e hoje ele assumiu o cargo de professor de História Antiga na Universidade de Innsbruck. E... I'll speak now to our non-Portuguese speakers. Professor Roland Steinecker, he is author of Die Vandalen, Aufstieg auf Sieg und Fall eines Barbaren Reichs. And he, he, was, he has this master's degree uh, with Professor Walter Pohl at the University of Vienna. And he got his, doc, his PhD in the same university in 2002, uh, directed by Herig Wolfram. Today, he's professor of ancient history at the University of Innsbruck. So, thank you very much, Professor Steinecker. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me to this impressive and big conference. Bom dia. I'm very sorry that uh, I'm unable to present in your beautiful Portuguese language. So we have to use the new lingua franc uh, English. Latin would have been another possibility, but that's not all too easy to understand. I um, start with my presentation. Roman and Greek ethnography had built up certain stereotypes as well as literary patterns long before 4th and 5th century Vandals, Goths, Burgundians or Franks entered the empire and built up new political entities in Gaul, Italy, Spain or Africa. At the end of the 5th century, sources used the term Gothic to label peoples as different as the Goths in Gaul, Spain and Italy, the Vandals in Africa, the Capits and Herulians along the Tistza and the Danube, the Rugians, Skiri and Burgundians, even the Sarmatians and Iranian Arabs. Greek and Latin authors had already used Goti or Gotoi or Gentis Gotike after the third century as a general term for peoples north of the Black Sea. These peoples were most often classified as Kuts, using ethnographical basics dating back to Greek ethnographers um, like Hecataios, Herodotus, or Erastosthenes. Unlike the late antique sources, 19th and 20th century scholarship included the so-called Gothic peoples within the idea of a widespread Germanic unity. Gothic peoples were classed as East Germanic peoples, Ostgermanen in German. The development of linguistic in the early 19th century had a deep impact on historical considerations. It was one of the reasons for these assumptions. Another reason was the deeply rooted wish to trace national origins back to the past. This suggested a uniformity of different barbarian groups which had never existed. No one in late antiquity would have known what was meant. Procopius introduction to his Vandal War is a good example of the Roman or better Romoian ethnographical point of view. 
Even after a century of barbarian rule in Africa or Italy, a Roman intellectual classed kings and elites according to barbarian groupings, traditional barbarian groupings. The Byzantine author described the biggest tribes of the Gothic peoples, the Ostrogoths, Visigoths, Vandals, Alans, and Gapids. Long ago, Palai, all these peoples were, according to Procopius, called Sauromatai or Belanchlainai or Gete altogether, Getica ethne. According to him, the Gothic peoples had different names, but were similar in their habits and belief. All Procopian gods had white skin, blonde hair, were tall and very good looking, had similar laws, and were Aryans. Christians, but Aryans. They spoke one Gothic tongue. Initially, this united people settled at the Ister River, it asked the Lower Danube. The single people is then separated, taking their new names from the names of their leaders. Throughout the 6th century, such ethnographic knowledge became a basis for Gothic Gatic history of Giordanus and Cassiodorus, so much discussed in recent scholarship. A new elite in Italy needed a political and historical identity, and Cassiodorus was eager to create one. As the followers of Theodoric were confronted with strong traditional identities in the Roman center, the, inte the intellectual frame had to be far-fetched. In a complicated text, Cassiodorus and or Giordanus managed to give the Goths an ancient and condign history using the literary motifs available. The Gatic history was one tool to link a rather young confederation having evolved at the Roman borders opposite the Dacian and Mercian provinces to the old Herodotian tales of origin for, for, um, for barbarians from the north. Ian Wood put it like this, cite, the notion that the Goths were gete gave the Romans a framework within which to respond to them. Procopius located the Vandals' plates of origin around the Meotian Lake, where already Herodotus described the encounter of the Scythians with the Amazons. Contrary to research opinions of the last two centuries, Procopius defined the origin of the 5th and 6th century Vandals not at the Baltic Sea, but exactly from where all Scythian nations were derived. Furthermore, in Procopius' view, Goths and Vandals were just the same. They were Scythian barbarians causing problems in the Roman West. When Geyseric tried to secure his position in the Mediterranean in the second half of the 5th century, Vandal fleets annually attacked the Italian coasts. When spring came, strong Vandal naval formations, numerosa classis, attacked the Roman shores. Considering the political situation, the Gallic aristocrat Sidonius Apollinaris saw the world order turned upside down. The Bursa, the hill in Carthage, where the proconsul's palace was located, and therefore the political center of the African provinces, was governed by the Caucasus. Once again, Sidonius alluded to a Scythian as um, the barbarian identity of the Vandals. In 534, Justinian promulgated the Corpus Juris Civilis. The initial sequence of this collection of laws lists the emperor's titles. After the Vandal Kingdom was destroyed by Belisarius in 533, Justinian used the triumphal titles Alanicus, Vandalicus, Africanus in various sections of the Ligesta, the Novelle, the Institutiones, and the Codex Justinianus, as well as in some inscriptions. The emperor appeared as the vanquisher of different barbarian gentes. 
such as the Alemannian Franks in the provinces of Germania Prima and Secunda at the Rhine, the Goths in Italy and Spain, the Antes at the Black Sea, and last but not least, the Alans and Vandals in Africa. Justinianus, Alamannicus, Gothicus, Francicus, Germanicus, Anticus, Alanicus, Vandalicus, Africanus, Pius, Felix, Inclitus, Victor, Ac, Triumphator, Semper, Augustus. Since the time of Augustus, such language of power had been used when neighboring groups acted against the center's wishes. Justinian wanted to make his fellow Romans to believe that the world had returned to how it had been for centuries. Rome ruled the world and all the Gentes were beaten and under control. Even if these Gentes had ruled Roman provinces for more than a century and in the end had managed to keep up a Roman order in these parts of the West in the African provinces. In this worldview, Gentes were bound to Rome by treaties and duties. In some cases, war was necessary to put things right again at the periphery. The world, Orbis Terrarum, and Rome, Orbis Romanus, were seen as one. The dependent client states, or Gentes, were seen as part of the empire, whether inside or outside the Roman borders. The Lataculus Veronensis lists about 100 provinces and 12 dioceses, trying to give an overview of the Roman Empire at the beginning of the 4th century. As a matter of course, this list also names 35 Gentes at the Roman borders. It even notes that these peoples were formed or evolved under Roman influence and, reached, uh, and reacted to Roman structures. In the eyes of the Roman elites in Ravenna or Constantinople, <coughs> sorry, the Vandals and Alans in the, in the African provinces were never more than barbarians under Roman rule. Whether in the provinces a different view existed or not is not totally clear. Nevertheless, both the Romans and the barbarians were part of a transforming Roman world. After 533, the Vandals and Alans and Alans disappeared as a political and military power. What remained were users and reusers of these ethnonyms throughout European history, not easy to explain. The triumphal epithets, Alanicus Vandalicus Africanus, used by Justinian, put the Vandals and Alans former rulers of the Roman provinces, Proconsularis, Byzacena, Numidia, Mauritania, and Tripolitana, back into a barbarian context. They again became simple gainters from the periphery, beaten by a Roman emperor. Until the 1970s. Scholarship put it somehow like this. Roman inhabitants with a clear awareness of their identity resisted to or at best sometimes cooperated with a culturally different and strongly separated group of conquerors from the north. Germanic barbarians settled in the countryside and had their problems with the alien yet sophisticated Roman culture. They used some Romans who had to serve them to care for a working late Roman society, to get food and money, to make the barbarians rich and powerful. Was the social and political gap between so-called Romans and so-called barbarians as wide as some sources make, uh, would like us to believe? What was the role of ethnic labels in the organization of Roman provinces in the 5th and 6th centuries? Can we trace specific searches for the use of ethnic labels in our sources? All this is being discussed in detail in recent research. In the following section of this presentation, Certain aspects of Vandal rule in the African provinces will be analyzed against the background of ethnic labels appearing in the titles of the Vandal kings to illustrate a great variety of possible political solutions in this age of Mediterranean history. Victor of Wieter's history of the persecu persecutions in the African provinces 
provides the richest source we have concerning 5th century Africa. This fact makes it very difficult to put Victor's view in context, let alone to confront his account with other evidence. The African bishop outlined a long-standing religious conflict between Bavarian Aryans and Romano-African Catholics. He used every possibility to stress the strong and impregnable difference between these groups. Victor's account can be understood as a nearly nostalgic attempt to reclaim a position of patient suffering for a Catholic church. This Catholic church for roughly one and a half centuries had not only been fully accepted by the Roman emperors, but also become the main leading and powerful religious community in the whole empire. Victor's extremely hostile account not only attacked everybody cooperating with the Vandals, it also questions the political system in Africa after 439, the year Geyseric and his Vandals conquered Carthage, as a whole. And exactly this fundamental quest should help to understand the basic conditions of Vandal North Africa and its relations as well as its role to, respectively, in the Roman Empire. Whether two edicts given in Victor's um, account are fully authentic or not cannot be clarified as his text mentioned above is our only source. Victor has the Überlieferungshoheit, a nice German term, um, being present in English nowadays too. The language used is an interesting point, pseudo-imperial. The king of the Vandals and Alans, Hunoric, is styled as a ruler with divine legitimacy. We do not wish for scandal in the provinces granted us by God. Provinciis adeo nobis concesis, scandalum esse nolumus. That the double title, Rex Vandalorum et Alanorum, existed and was in use, remains a matter of fact. Gillimus Bessin, together with what we know from Victor's text, hints to a use in certain circles and for certain circumstances. Apart from this, it remains a possibility that Hunerich exploited the title in a heated situation to demonstrate Hesting power on a special occasion. Due to the long-standing discussions on religious practice in the Proconsular province, the king may have employed a title normally reserved for internal use in the inner circles of Hasting power. It is difficult to judge how many persons belonged to this inner Vandal circle. Maybe all soldiers labeled Vandals or only some very powerful men near the king and the other members of the royal Hesting house. In the end, Victor gives throughout his text a discussion of how the African provinces should be organized, especially concerning the role the Catholic Church um, should have. Such discourse touch touched the core interests of the leading Vandals and the Hasting House. In a situation like this, the twofold royal title could have been used willingly by Hunerik to stress the right of federal soldiers or their rich and privileged leaders to get what they thought to be their right. Research has not been able to explain what happened under Geyseric in the first decades of the Vandal regime. But the imperial lands and vast parts of the senatorial property had been allocated amongst Geyseric, the Hesting family, and their followers. And that constituted the real basis of the system that the Vandals had established in the rich African provinces. As we still do not understand the system in detail, it's a risky argument. But we can see that juridical power and possession rights in a certain in certain provinces, as well as an Aryan religious creed, are the two basic principles that we need to explain to understand the title's background. 
Only one aspect has to be stressed. In the Royal Edict of 484, under discussion here and only known from Victor from Victor's account, King Huneric tried to invoke the, theologi the theological adjudications sorry, of the councils of Arminium, now this Rimini, and Solakia from the year 359 on the provinces under his rule. Doing this, the Aryan church was seen as the only holy, apostolic, and Catholic in the original sense of being universal, church with a full legitimation. This reads as follows in the text of the Royal Edict of 484. On the first day, our venerable bishops proposed to them, it has the Catholics, that they prove the homoousion in a proper fashion from the divine scriptures, just as they had been asked to do, failing which they would certainly condemn something which was done away with by a thousand and more bishops from the whole world at the Council of Ariminium and Solakia. The fact that Victor relates King Huneric's edict as promulgating a ban of Catholic liturgy in the so-called Sortes Vandalorum in the Proconsularian province has been discussed intensively for more than 150 years in modern research. At the beginning of the edict, the king again alludes to the trueness of Arian Christology. It is well known that not once, but quite often, your priest, Honoric addresses obviously the Catholic clergy, have been forbidden to celebrate any liturgies at all in the territory of the Vandals, in Sortibus Vadarorum, in case they seduce Christian souls and destroy them. Whether these sorters can be seen as a territory of a Vandal settlement, older research, however uh, such may be defined, or whether the wording implies a certain juridical definition remains quite unclear. In any case, they do not seem to refer to the entire territory of the kingdom. Different areas of jurisdiction may have existed in the African provinces, maybe only in the territory of former imperial and senatorial latifundia of the proconsular province, now possessed by the Hastings, did the king have full juridical power. At the same time, it was in the Hastings' interest to secure and prolong the possessions and allotments rights they had achieved. Arianism may have been a central ideological strategy in doing so. Like Emperor Constantius II intended to change the results of Nicaea, the Vandal King Huneric tried this for the parts of the African provinces and in some respect um, um, also for the rest of the empire. He acted like a Roman emperor and the edicts cited by Victor use a juridical terminology known from late antique imperial chancelleries. Peter Heather put it like this. Like many mainland Roman churchmen of the mid 4th century, the 5th century Vandals should be seen, therefore, as adherents of a more conservative theology, unhappy with the potentially embarrassing connotations of homoousias. This means, in the end, no rude barbarians try to impose their strange and foreign religion to on, on fettered Romans. The Vandal kings just had become patrons of followers of a certain Christology after 381, no longer supported by other elites in Ravenna or Constantinople. Arians came from different social groups. Federati, federates, for example, were not subject to the religious laws issued by Theodosius on the, on the accepted doctrine after 381. During the first two decades of the 5th century, the Gothic army acting in Illyricum, Italy, Gaul, and later Spain, became somehow a role model for barbarian armed forces acta, acting inside the borders of the Roman Empire. For decades, the Vandals had a fierce rivalry with prestigious Gothic groups. This only demonstrates that they struggled for prestige, power, and influence in the late Roman world. 
They develop a specific skill set for their group identity. Becoming, becoming a barbarian soldier inside the imperial borders requi required specific strategies of distinction. Accepting the creed of Armenium Solarkia was one of them. After 439, remaining in Arian meant using the opportunities of the Vandal realm. Furthermore, Geyseric and Unuric performed policy to support Arian circles all over the empire. When the Emperor Sido tried to negotiate for the ordination of a new Catholic bishop in Carthage, Hunerik had a condition. The bishops of our religion, who are at Constantinople and throughout the other provinces of the East, are to have the right to preach to the people in whatever language they wish in their churches and to practice the Christian religion just as you will have this right here in Carthage and in the other churches which are in the provinces of Africa to celebrate Mass preach and do the things which pertain to your religion in whatever way you wish. One of the claims against the emperor is free choice of language for the homily. It is likely that the Aryan clergy in Africa used the Gothic idiom as their language of liturgy. One of the differences between Catholic and Aryan liturgy was the possible use of a vernacular in church instead of Latin or Greek. The Gothic liturgy and the Gothic Bible should not be interpreted as conscious responses to the needs of a Germanic cultural context, but must rather be understood as consequences of the linguistic pluralism of the Eastern churches. It remains one pattern of a military and barbarian identity to be Aryan and to see Gothic as a language of church service. Basically, Victor used two strategies to denounce the Vandal kings. First, he pictured them like Roman emperors persecuting the Christians. For example, two royal officials, comitas, tried to convince Catholics to change the confession. The true Christians, according to Victor, acclaimed Christiani Sumus and confessed the Trinity according to Nicaea and Constantinople. This wording and the whole scene is reminiscent of the imperial persecutions during the third century and the Vandal king appears as the cruel persecutor, like Diocletian or other emperors. This meant making the Vandals tyrants, rulers without any legitimacy to rule in a Christian world. At the same time, Victor styled the Vandal kings <clears throat> as Ariani, nearly denying that they were Christians at all. Now, exactly these bad guys had, again, according to Victor, the chutzpah to use laws rightful Christian emperors, like Theodosius the Great, had proclaimed to protect the Catholic Church against Arians and other heretics. Victor is quite explicit in this. They did not blush for shame in deploying against us a law which our Christian emperors seeking to do honor to the Catholic Church had previously, previously issued against them and other heretics to which they added many things of their own just as seemed good to their tyrannical power. Like an emperor, Hunerik dared to impose laws that had been created to protect the Church against the African Catholics. But the laws used have been carefully adapted by skilled attorneys in Carthage, using the archives, using the libraries available in this major city. The Codex Theodosianus, chapter 16, provided many laws against heretics now aiming at the African Catholics. When the core interests of the former federates, their allotments, their payment were under question, one knew how to act. A Vandal identity was used as an expression of a strong political strategy of distinction. At the same time, the Vandal quest for power in the Western Roman provinces changed the political language in use. After Hunerik's marriage with Eudokia, 
the possibilities of a Hasting prince um, or king, as well as the chance for acceptance in the African provinces, had dramatically changed. An inscription from Henshir Koribeya near Aymila in the province of Numidia labels Gelimer Dominus, Dominus Gailimer. This inscription represents the majority of titles used by Vandal kings in the available sources. No inscription, coin, leg uh, coin legend, or dating formula using an ethnic title is known. This is true for all the kingdoms in the transforming Roman West before the 6th century, of course. The titulature of rulers in the former Roman provinces of the West used terms familiar from late imperial usage. As long as they were not named along with the emperor, kings of barbarian descent were labeled Domini Nostri. Other possibilities to label a ruler in <clears throat> Italy, Spain, Gaul, or Africa were Dominus with different attributes, or concerning the Gothic kings um, and Odoacer, Flavius. Along with these late imperial terms, Rex was used frequently, often together with Dominus. Most images of the 5th and 6th century kings on material objects, like the seal of Hilderic, the medallion of Theodoric, or the so-called Wieso of Agilulf, carry inscriptions styling the kings simply Rex. Not surprisingly, the Vandal kings used the potentus honorific Dominus or Rex. From Guntermund's reign on, Dominus began to appear on silver coin issues, itself an important ideological declaration. At the same time, no gold coins were issued on, on, in, in Africa. Also, the currency was based on the imperial solidus. Vandal coinage appears as a provincial issue. The emperor cared for the gold, the Vandal king guaranteed the silver and bronze issues in daily life and economies. One of the tablet Albatini has the title Rex Invictissimus. These tablets are, unlike Victor's account, legal documents without any transformation due to literary aims. The the attributes Invictissimus, Gloriosissimus, Clementissimus, and Piissimus are known from the Roman senatorial order of rank or the imperial court, as well as from other late Roman kingdoms with the barbarian elite. Not only was the late antique emperor frequently addressed as Imperator Princeps, but uh, the title was often used in conjunction with attributes such as Piissimus, Clementissimus, Sapientissimus, or Invictissimus. The, the Exarch in Italy was a via Excellentissimus in the Byzantine order of ranks. Barbarian kings or generals often held first ranks of the cursus honorum, like the office of a magister militum or even a consulship, and thus were entitled to the attributes Gloriosissimus, Excellentissimus, or Prezellentissimus. Theodoric or Hilderic were Gloriosissimus rex like the Burgundian king Gundobad. The latter was Ricimer's nephew and his successor as the Patricius of Italy. Furthermore, he held the office of a magister utrius que militiae per Gallias. No Vandal king ever held a high-ranking Roman office. It is noticeable that only after Hunerick's marriage with the imperial princess Adokia, the daughter of Valentinian III, taken from Rome in 455, um, there, there appears a titulature known for barbarian kings and accepted by Roman authorities. This is not the case for Hunerick, only for his nephews, Guntermund and Trasamund, as well as his son Hilderic. Guntermund appears as a Rex Invictissimus on one of the Tablet Albertini. Invictissimus derives clearly from imperial terminology. What the German scholarship called the Invictie, the distinction of a victorious commander, was a distinctive rating in antiquity frequently used by emperors. Commodus, furthermore, had the epithet of a Hercules Romanus. 
The god Mitras, so popular among the military in the Roman Empire, was also entitled as Invictus. In the Greek East, emperors were celebrated as Ane Aneiketos in inscriptions, um, the Greek equation of the Latin Invictus. This Greek term is known since the rule of Emperor Trajan. It has to be stressed that the epithet had not been in use in highly official bureaucratic texts as for example Roman military diplomas, but we can find it frequently in inscriptions. Emperors from Septimius Severus to Constantine the first were labeled as the unbeaten sun god, the Helios and Iketos. The emperor represented the victorious sun god as the Sol Invictus, the Helios and Niketos. From the struggle with the powers of gloom, the ruler descended as the great victor. Leo Berlinger styled the emperor as an incarnated supreme stellar goddess. In Africa, the top of the Roman senatorial elite lost their power after the changes of the first half of the 5th century. How Geyseric changed the land tenure and the basic economic and social conditions that were always a concern for the small ruling class remains a matter of discussion. Victor of Reader and Procopius, our main sources concerning these changes, put them in a dark light and used stereotypes of Roman versus barbarian. The Bishop Victor did this in defense of the Catholic Church, the Byzantine officer Procopius, to justify the wars of Justinian. As a matter of fact, Kaiseric managed to concentrate enough property to enable his Hasting family, his Hasting royal house, to act as a big player in the Mediterranean from the middle of the 5th century on. Kaiseric was concerned to establish all of his sons in organizing the newly acquired vast property. After the rebellion of 442, no threat to the Hasting power came from outside the royal family. Hunerik had powerful rivals among his own relatives, and Hilderic's reign saw the emerging of new alliances within the family. So, after Kaiseric and Hunerik had managed to get rid of their competitors within the army, which had prevailed in the complicated situation of the African provinces in the first half of the 5th century, the family itself became a battleground of power struggles in the African kingdom of the Hastings. Hunerik's brother Theodoric died in exile and his wife and son were killed. The Aryan patriarch Eucundus was burned in public because he was an advisor of Theodoric's at the latter's court. Many counts and nobles close to Theodoric were persecuted. Hunic ordered to burn some of them and to execute others. Finally, King Hunic exiled Godagis, the son of his younger brother Gento. I hope the table helps you. I know a lot of personal names. Mighty Vandals were tortured and removed from power as they were accused of participating in a plot against the ruling king. Victor reports that Hunerik deprived of power Kaiseric's Comitatus, a group of the latter's closest advisors. Following this, Hunerik tried to convince the African Catholic bishops to support a change in Kaiseric's succession order in favor of his son Hilderic. Victor stressed that all the violence within the royal family and the leading circles of the Vandals was motivated by Hunerik's wish to secure the succession of his own son Hilderic to the Hasting throne. This would have violated the agnetic seniority Geyseric had introduced. One interpretation suggests that Victor told the story this way in order to limit the king's concern regarding resistance within the royal house against his own rule. Securing the position of his son would have been only of secondary importance in this reading. Victor's interest in refer referring to the violence amongst the royal and other leading vandals was intended to highlight the, barbari the barbarity and cruelty of Hunerik and his followers, of course. 
By concentrating all the political action performed by Hunerich to dynastic pretensions against the constitutio of Kaiseric, Victor managed to present the king as an illegitimate, illegi illegitimate ruler under his own vandal rules. This fits well in with Victor's textual strategies. On the other hand, it remains a possibility that Hunerich really intended to change the succession order in the interest of the new legitimacy possible for his son only if he were the son of an imperial princess. The high prestige of Hunerix and Adokia's offspring made a major difference to Hastings' possibilities before. At the same time, all this may have caused a need to address the old Vandal elites. The military leaders following Geyseric may be disappointed by the power struggles and the executions amongst them. Hunnik was in need to prove himself as the real Vandal king, the Rex Vandalorum et Alanorum. It remains a possibility that Victor of Vita refers to a title with a political background from the time of Geyseric, which his son stressed for specific purposes in his own reign to attract and convince the privileged Vandals owning land and power in the African provinces, upset by the new political solutions the son of Geyseric looked for. What we can trace are the power struggles in the African elites of the time. The use of the strong ethnic title by Hunerich witnesses these struggles and Victor did not invent or create a title. He gives, maybe unwillingly, a trace of the problems of his age inside the barbarian military elite in Africa at the end of the 5th century. Hunerich did not prevail. After his death, his nephew Guntermund, our Rex Invictissimus, remember the uh, Tablet Abatini, acceded to the Hastings throne. Now apparently other circles took over and followers of Hunerich's policy may have been persecuted themselves. As we do not know much about Guntermund's reign, the situation after the end of Victor's account is difficult to explain. What we do know is that the few sources we have did not use the title Rex Vandalorum et Alanor. On the contrary, Guntermund, Trasimund, and Hilderic are labeled as rulers in the Western Roman Mediterranean with a political language well known and comparable to what we know from Gaul, Spain, or Italy. But such a Roman language of power was present in Hunerich's time too. It was Hunerich who adopted an air of a mystic and an, an mysticable imperial arrogance in renaming an African city in his own honor. Hadrumetum was known as Uniricopolis for the duration of his reign. After the end of the Vandal realm, the city was renamed Justinianopolis. Guntermund, Trasamund, and Hilderic all had panegyrics composed in their honor as a Roman emperor would have. Hilderic was a special case. The son of Valentinian's daughter Adokia and the Vandal King Hunerich could claim direct descent from the imperial and prestigious Theodosian house. This lineage may have been stressed in the wall paintings of a new palace complex in the Cartagian suburb of Ancle. The poet Luxorius celebrated Hilderic as the mighty Vandal king and offspring of the imperial house. This made him the heir of a twin crown, Vandalerike potens gemini dia dimetis heres. The victorious grandson of Valentinian had finally beaten all the enemies of Rome, Hostas and Gentes, at least in the described wall paintings of a palace near Carthage. The offspring of barbarian federates stresses his maternal Roman rights more than his barbarian roots. In Italy, Theodoric was labeled Domitor Gentium and Victor Gentium, which recalls of the praising addressed to Hilderic. After Pelissa's victory, the Vandal king Gallimere and his followers were taken to Constantinople. In Procopius' account, the deposed king is clothed with a purple coat and treated as a relative of the great emperors of the Theodosian dynasty. Gelimer is offered 
a land estate north of the capital where he could live in peace with his family. It is only because he does not convert to the Catholic faith that he cannot become a senator of Constantinople. One might expect a different treatment of a beaten and conquered barbarian king. The emphasis on imperial ideology that we find in Luxorius' poem illustrates the possibilities of Hastings' policy after the marriage of 455 quite well. The four sons, um, again, the table is needed, the four sons of Gailerit, Zazzo, Guntimer, Amatas, and the later King Gelimer were not, however, directly related to the imperial Theodosian house. This made a difference, even if Gallimere was treated in the way it is reported by Procopius in Constantinople in 533. Hilderich's propaganda may have indicated the new direction he wished the Vandal monarchy to take. Hilderich's obvious attempts to reposition the Hasting monarchy along pseudo-imperial lines may have caused Gallimere's fear of this inheritance in favor of Hoermer or Hoergeis, Hilderich's nephews. Hoermer was praised by Procopius as the Achilles of the Vandals and appears to have been distinguished, uh, a distinguished military leader. This would explain somehow Gallimere's usurpation and the harsh treatment of his relatives. Hilderich was killed and Hoermer blinded. The fact that after the coup, close relatives of Gelimer, such as Satzon and Amatas, staffed important positions in the kingdom and replaced the nephews of Hilderic, strengthens this point of view. There are similar structures behind the problems. Behind the problems Hilderic had with his family and Gelimer's usurpation. Twice the Theodosian lineage after Hunerich's marriage with Hedokia could be the background. Two rulers saw murder and heavy conflicts within the royal family, Hunerich and Gallimere. Therefore, it seems likely that this had to do with the various claims to the throne by different branches of the family. One part operated with the imperial lineage and obviously preferred titles common to other provinces of the transforming Roman West as a language of power. In opposition to this branch of the family around Hunerik and his lineage of a, um, a kind of vandalicity may have been stressed by other Hastings in order to convince certain vandal circles of the validity of taking power in the African provinces. At the same time, Hunerik would have been in need to stress his support of certain rich vandals and their interests by using the twofold title with its strong ethnic affiliation. There are two supporting documents for the use of the title Rex Vandalorum et Alanorum. Victor of Vita attests the use of the title for Hunerik. Hunerik may have imposed such a title to emphasize his rigor in acting against the Catholic Church, but rather the ethnic title was intended to show the Vandal elites that the son-in-law of an emperor knew how a true Vandal king should articulate his power. At the same time, Hunerich's church policy can be understood as an attempt to establish a strong Hasting rule with an Aryan church in the interest of military circles around the Mediterranean. A similar explanation is possible for Gallimer. When he took power, he had to stress certain aspects of uh, a Vandal identity once more. The silver ball can be interpreted as a part uh, of a quest for power by groups in opposition to Hilderich's policy. It reveals the situation. One branch of the royal family against the other, a power game within rather small cliques in the African um, provinces. The title may have sparked memories of Geyseric and evoked feelings of glory and power in the hearts of certain privileged offsprings of members of the Wendel Allen army of the first half of the fifth century. Or it may have been an invention of Hunerich's advisors trying to convince followers of his brother or other royals as mighty vandals that this king was also supporting them and their privileges. 
At the same time, Hunaric had the capability to widen the Hastings circles of power beyond the African provinces and to be accepted in these provinces as a ruler married to an emperor's daughter. This alone may have caused conflicts in the inner circles of the power, fearing for their system of allotment and their privileged position as military leaders in a late Roman society. We do not know all this in detail. The first half of the fifth century was an agitated period and identities emerged and disappeared again quickly. The African provinces in between 439 and 533 had a late Roman society which had attun att attenuated the harsh conflicts between military barbarian groups and other elites in the Western Roman Empire in the fourth and fifth centuries. Much of Geyseric's and Humeric's reign was focused on solving problems related to these tensions. The background is the struggle for power and wealth in the African provinces, most likely the disputes within a single royal family. The different branches of this family operated with two possible languages of power. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much for your inspiring presentation, Mr. Steinacker. Well, uh, we're going to go to the questions now. We got quite a few, actually. You can send you can also send your messages in Portuguese. I will translate them to a professor. Well, we have a question from Joaquin Roberto Fagundes. He said, Good morning, teacher. I would like to know your opinion on what was the greatest historical religious impact on the relations of the Vandals in Europe. Good point. Good question. Nice to meet you, dear colleague. Let's put it like this, the, the when North Africa had, had the opportunity to develop as a medieval European country, like Spain did, like Gaul did, difference, it um, was destroyed by Justinian's armies. So the Vandals did not have enough time to create a medieval afterlife like the Franks, the Goths, uh, or even the Lombards did. And so I answer your question in not answering it, if you would accept. <laughs> I can read Portuguese so far using Latin. <laughs> well, Thiago Cavalcanti said, good morning, professor. I would like to hear on the economic relations between the Vandals and the Byzantines. That's a good one. That's also, a very good one, yeah. Also, was there a presence of Catholic refugees from Vandal Africa in the empire or of Aryan Roman to the Vandalic kingdom? Uh, that will be the case of Fugentius, right? So, yes, yes, of course. Where do we start? Um, dense economic relations. Um, I talked a bit about um, the currency. The Vandal kings uh, introduced this starts in the last years of Kaiseric. But what they did is accepting the super regional uh, system based on the solitus and providing a local system of silver and bronze issues. This is quite interesting. So they cared for the economy running in their area at the same time um, staying within the bigger system um, running uh, along the Mediterranean. First um, um, point to stress, there is a 
dense um, uh, export uh, of um, agricultural products from Africa, not only to Italy, but also to the East. Uh, African uh, ceramics uh, can be traced down in, 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 in a huge density throughout the Mediterranean world uh, in the years of uh, the Vandal realm. So this means absolutely no breakdown, absolutely no problems. On the contrary, Africa seems to have flourished under Vandal rule and um, there have been wars, of course, uh, 468 and Matroyan uh, tried to invade Africa. Uh, this caused problems, but uh, nothing we can see in the archaeological evidence. So this, uh, so far for the economy, um, have a look in Richard Miles and Andy Merrill's wonderful book in English on the Vandals. I think it was published in 2010. Um, the chapters there, mainly written by Richard Miles, um, are really clever and really uh, great concerning the archaeological evidence concerning um, the history of economics in um, the African provinces and the interconnection with the Mediterranean, Mediterranean world. So, okay, and the presence of Catholic refugees from the Vandal from Vandal Africa and the Empire, yes. We do know even uh, specific persons <clears throat> fleeing to Constantinople. There are some imperial laws quite early um, after the um, uh, conquest of Carthage in 439, Emperor Valentinian, for example, cares for lawyers who lost everything in the provinces taken over by the Vandals, and he tries to privilege them to be able to do their job outside the provinces where they lived initially. We know from um, bishops uh, being exiled by the Vandal kings or fleeing from Africa, for example, Sardinia, you mentioned Fulgentius, for example, uh, you know the material quite well. They, they 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 had correspondence. They were connected to the popes in Rome. So so there is there are even letters um, documenting this. Um, there are some sources talking about powerful, important members of the senatorial class uh, trying to convince the emperor in Constantinople to attack the Vandal Kingdom. So of course, of course. Many people lost um, property when Geyseric rearranged the provinces. This, this is for sure. This was harsher, much harsher than what Odoaca or Theodoric did in Italy. This, this is quite clear. On the other hand, there are smaller families um, staying in Africa, staying as, um, uh, with, 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 with possessions in Africa. And we even have traces of families who got back parts of their property. So it's a complicated picture. I'm sure Geyseric took the imperial latifundia, the imperial property, and he tried to um, paralyze the mighty senatorial big players with their huge domains in Africa. I'm sure he took this too. And then there are, there's a huge variety of possibilities. So for the Catholic refugees from Vandal Africa to the empire, I hope to have answered this. Aryan um, um, clergy, bishops, yes, we know about them. Ralph Mattison published a wonderful article, a very clever article. Yeah, you're nodding, you know the article uh, of a certain Maximinus, who seems to have been an Aryan bishop working for Geyseric, deliberately working for Geyseric in the early stages of the Vandal Kingdom, um, he took the chance to have a new patron, to have a rich and powerful patron, and he acted um, as a diplomat um, in the interest of Geyseric on Sicily, for example. And there are several other ex uh, examples. So I'm convinced that not only the Vandals, also the Goths um, or other military uh, groups um, were interesting for Aryan clergy to make a career. And Africa must have been a dream for Aryan priests. There they got their um, Freunde in German, uh, 
they, they, they got their um, seats as bishops, they got uh, church property taken from the Catholic Church. We know this uh, not only from Victor von um, Ovita, uh, the church property was transferred to the Aryan Church and bishops were installed in many cities. So yes, there are uh, Aryans uh, uh, joining the dance. Mm. Yes, if you allow me to comment on that, e, here at the University of São Paulo, we have a Giovanni do Nascimento, who is working on a PhD thesis on the exiled bishops under the Vandal Africa. Great, so, when the virus will not harm us any longer, we could think of meeting and discussing this. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Well, Fabiano Fernandes, he, put, he asked the question. He is the coordinator of the LIMEB, or mm -hmm. Laboratório de Estudos Medievais, to which I'm very grateful to be here, very honored. He wants to know, I would like to know a little more about the relationship between the Bishop of Rome and the Vandals at the end of the fifth century. Yeah, ni nice to meet you uh, on the internet, dear colleague. Um, the popes try to protect the exiled African bishops. We know some details concerning sending clothes and even books to exiled African bishops. Um, the Patriarch of Rome, of course, does not like uh, that in his southern courtyard, a second church is installed. But at the same time, there have been tensions and problems in between the uh, Cartesian bishops and the Roman bishops. So maybe the Aryan attack on the strong and um, um, the African church with this huge tradition I just have to mention Augustine and, and, and Tertullian before and so on. A dense network of cities, a lot of bishops. They tended to organize themselves uh, in their own way. They were much more interested in a strong um, Cartesian um, uh, prefecture than accepting the Roman uh, domination. To keep it short, it might be that the Roman bishops, bishops haven't been totally unhappy of an uh, uh, African church being weaker than before. Well, we have a question from Giovanni do Nascimento. Is the guy who was talking just now? Uh, he said, thank you for your inspiring uh, communication, Professor Steinecker. It's interesting how the, how the ethnic stereotypes are constructed and mobilized and acted upon in, co in political contexts and uh, deriving from particular motivations. What are the implications of those linguistic strategies to the ways in which we uh, approach the ethnic identities in a period in a general manner. And he concluded, wouldn't that be the case to think about them in a fluid manner as constructs of language uh, instead, of rea instead of concrete realities? How do you see the relationship between the distinction strategies of, the, of those uh, linguistic distinctions and ethnic identities at uh, the concrete sense? So with, with, if, if I really try to concentrate myself, it's possible to understand this wonderful language. Okay, language. I think that throughout late antiquity, language was not a central point if you wanted to build up an ethnic identity. It was just not necessary uh, to have a common language. There is a huge discussion ongoing whether there has been something like uh, a specific Wendel language, yes or no. 
as a matter of fact, we only know some traces of liturg liturgical um, um, sentences mentioned by Catholic opponents. So the um, famous Wendel Curie Eleison, the Freuer Armes, which uh, is included in a manuscript um, written by a Catholic bishop arguing against the Homoian errors, of course. This is Gothic. This is nothing new. This is nothing specific. This is just Gothic language used in liturgy. Um, yeah, think of the famous uh, Bible of Wolfiller, the translation of Wolfiller, um, copied in Gothic Italy uh, a century later. No traces of a Vandal language, personal names, yes, but they could be labeled as Gothic too, if you would not know that the Vandals have been around. Where is the language of the Rugians, the Herulians, and so on and so on. So my personal view is that um, most of these confederations used Latin or something like uh, understandable version of something like a super regional Gothic language to communicate, but their ethnic identity had other purposes uh, much more important um, than a common identity um, uh, secured by uh, language uh, used. Uh, to keep it short, to break it down, the Vandals acted inside the Roman Empire for two decades before they even entered Africa. And what did they do? They fought as an army against the Romans or with a particular um, Roman um, mighty ones. For example, Constantine III, um, Michael Kulikowski, I'm quite sure that he proved that Constantine III, when he uh, tried his usurpation, uh, paid the Vandals in Gaul to fight for him. And what do you do as a soldier fighting? You uh, try to communicate with your Allen and Suevian and other um, comrades in arms maybe via Latin, because everybody knows the commands uh, and the military terminology in use. Okay, complicated answer, complicated question, big field of studies, big problem, of course, but forget the 19th century um, typology, clear thing, Vandals, Vandal language. It's not that clear. Well, we have another question in Portuguese. Uh, it's from Geraldo. Uh, he has. Ah, we know each other. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> yes. Professor Steinecker, congratulations for your excellent work that you've been developing. In your book, Die Vandalen, you identify the Vandal identities as assimilated to Romanity. I would like to know how do you consider the integration and interaction between in, interaction between vandals and the provincial populations from north africa yeah thank you for the question uh Geraldo. when we are talking about the vandals we are talking about an elite being a vandal soldier means that you are not a common one. You, 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 you are not poor. And the Vandal officers, the mighty ones, the big players uh, inside the Vandal army, they tried to act like Roman aristocrats, at least um, in the later 5th and 6th century. Remember the poems, um, the poem I mentioned, uh, Praising Hilderic by a poet named Luxorius. 
in the Anthologia Latina, a manuscript um, from Paris, the Codex Almosianus um, transferred these texts. In the Anthologia Latina, there are several Vandal aristocrats being praised example for their beautiful garden, full of statues, um, alluding to ancient mythology. They are praised for um, loving poetry, uh, knowing Latin at a high level. King Trasimund um, in the sixth century is proud of being able to argue with a Catholic counterpart, with a Catholic bishop um, in Latin. So Trasimund is an educated, uh, clever man who knows the philosophical background, who knows the uh, who, who knows Latin at the necessary label. Vandals who were successful uh, entered uh, the sphere of a late Roman elite. And they acted, they lived, they dressed, they uh, um, made parties, they did everything a Roman aristocrat in Italy or the East would do. And all we know, including the so-called Vandal graves, um, the um, archaeology tends to separate um, Vandal and Christian um, burials, which is odd. The Vandals had been Christians too. The difference is that um, it hasn't been common any longer in Africa to put valuable, valuable objects in the graves. Okay, as a matter of fact, the Vandals seem to bring this habit again to the African provinces. There are some few, not, not 20 altogether, uh, rich barriers around Cartridge, Cartridge mostly. And yeah, I'm aiming at the uh, style we can identify in these grace, be it male, be it female, by the way. And they dress uh, like um, a Byzantine noble would have dressed in the later fifth or sixth century. Um, all the details, their shoes, uh, the rests of um, the jewelry we know, <clears throat> um, could show you some pictures. Uh, th 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 this is, it it's amazing. For, for example, there is a grave uh, at Tobuba Mayos, south of Carthage. Sorry, it's difficult without, with, without a picture. Um, a female burial where earrings have been found. And if you look at the famous mosaic showing Empress Theodora at San Vitale um, at Ravenna, this exact the same style, exact the same earrings. Okay, so long answer, short question. Okay, we have time for another last question. Rafael Montpellier. A, a colleague of ours, he asked, uh, he said, good morning, professor. Thank you very much for your excellent communication. Uh, the question is, with the end of the Vandal dom Dominion in Africa, a great question remains. Uh, to where did the, uh, the Vandal elite went? To where did they go after the end of the Vandal Kingdom in Africa? Very clever question. Good question. Thank you, Raphael. Procopius tells us about two regiments recruited from the surviving Vandals, Justinian Belisarius, sent to the Eastern Front immediately. After they crushed, um, after the big battles uh, of 43 uh, of, uh, 40, uh, 43 and um, uh, I, I can't remember the exact term. I think it's Tagmata. So two regiments of um, armored cavalry um, uh, are sent to the Eastern Front. Others just died. A lot of Vandals resisted and died in the battles. Um, there is a very interesting 
account in Procopius, Byzantine soldiers guarding Africa in the years after the conquest married widows of Vandal warriors. And these widows, Procopius tells us the story, these widows tell their new husbands, don't accept this, my that Vandal husband had the right for certain allotments. He was paid much better than you are. Um, resist, try an uprise, try to get the privileges back. I own these privileges as your uh, legal wife. Uh, we want the Vandal privileges back. This is a most interesting Procopian um, um, story he tells and there is an uprising actually the uh, uh, byzantine soldiers can um, um, they, they try together with some vandals other part of my answer some vandals are around in africa and try to reconquer uh, Carthage, for example stotzas um, is the name of one of the leaders um, all this is in procopius it's it's uh, the 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 second part of Procopius' account deals with the story after 533, wars against uh, Moorish um, confederations in the south and the problems the Byzantines had um, in the Cartesian mainland. So there are still vendors around in Africa, there are um, widows of Vandal uh, soldiers trying to convince their new husbands to get the privileges back the dead vandals had. There are vandals who um, serve in the Byzantine army at the personal front. There are members of the royal house or high-ranking vandals around Gallimere um, getting a nice uh, life north of Constantinople uh, as guests of the emperor. So this, this is what I know. <laughs> what were those privileges you're talking about? Were they the sorties vandalorum? This, this is a huge discussion. This is a very, very, very complicated thing to answer because I'm sure all the colleagues at your university know about the Goffert Julia debates concerning has this been money? Has this been property? Did they settle there? My personal opinion is that the Sortes Vandalorum, labeled Cleroi Bandilon by Procopius, this could have been something like um, a military camp combined with, a Latif with Latifundia. So agricultural surplus, paying and nurturing the soldiers combined with um, stables, uh, places of production for military coats, for example, uh, weaponries, blacksmiths, all this concentrated military complexes combined with latifundia big enough to feed and pay the soldiers. My personal opinion. But was this text-based? Was this taken from Roman aristocrats? Was this newly established? We just don't know enough. I'm quite sure that there has been no vandal settlement in the countryside. All the research thought that uh, vandals were proud farmers who got their little farm um, in the African heartlands I think the Vandals uh, lived in the cities and were professional soldiers, well-paid professional soldiers uh, within a well-equipped and um, organized army. But Reed Goffert, the, I think on one of my um, slides, there is a citation uh, citing Yves Moderon uh, and citing Walter Goffert. They had 10 years ago, there was a harsh conflict in between Moderon and Goffert concerning how to inter interpret 
the Sortis Vandalorum, how to understand the Sortis Vandalorum? Yes, I think it's uh, in, a, in an article, it's called Administrative Methods of Barbarian Settlement in the 5th Century, the Definitive Account by yeah, Walter yeah, Goffard. Yeah, yeah. It's very incisive in that one. This is a very, very clever article and the debate is complicated. I think this is one of the most complicated fields um, in late antiquity at the moment and still unclear, still unsolved. Yes, because in Visigothic Aquitania, there's the same problem. Italy, yeah, yeah. Gaul. Yes. Yeah. Well, Your generation I, will solve the problem. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think we're out of questions. Is that right? I long for Brazilian coffee now. <clears throat> oh. Be sure to get the Minas Gerais one. Yes, yes. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here with us today. All and the best hope... for the conference. Thank you very much. I hope when this is all over, you can come to Brazil and we can have uh, coffee. another coffee and a big conference. <laughs> too. Thank you very much, Professor Steinecker. Greetings to Brazil. Obrigado a todos presentes, a gente vai encerrar a comunicação do professor por aqui e mais uma vez agradeço ao Laemeb pela honra e até a próxima <risos>